Hey folks, in this video we're going to be going over how to do EIS circuit fitting of a proton exchange membrane, or PEM, water electrolyzer. This video is based off of a webinar led by my colleague Neil Spinner, where Neil did EIS circuit analysis of systems submitted by researchers, such as yourself. If you're interested in attending future webinars, please follow us on Twitter, on YouTube, and check out our website for future webinars. This video is broken up into several sections. We'll go over what exactly is a PEM water electrolyzer, what circuit model to actually use, and finally the circuit fitting and analysis of the data. Please note that this is user submitted data, it is not our own, and so there may be some interpretation to the data and the system, we don't know all of the experimental details. Before we begin, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Without further ado, the first example that I'm going to go through involves someone who submitted data studying a uh, PEM water electrolyzer. So this stands for proton exchange membrane. Uh, for those who may be familiar with fuel cells, uh, PEM fuel cell or PEM FC, uh, this electrolyzer is basically a reverse PEM fuel cell. So if, again, if you're familiar with fuel cells, you may be you may know that you provide hydrogen and oxygen, it outputs water, and you get power or electricity out. An electrolyzer is essentially the exact opposite. You input power or electricity, and then you get fuel out of it. So rather than being a device that powers something like a car or a building or the power grid, an electrolyzer is something that you have to input power, but you get a usable product. Um, it, you know, some of you may work or have worked in research laboratories where there's plumbed uh, oxygen or hydrogen gas. For example, when I was in graduate school, we had uh, pressurized, you know, hydrogen and oxygen gas into the whole laboratory to help do experiments. And there was an electrolyzer that provided those um, gases. So that's what this is essentially studying. So the example electrolyzer from this person who submitted their data has a commercial uh, platinum on carbon catalyst at the cathode, a thin iridium film at the anode, and then a commercial um, Nafion-212 membrane. And so the reason this person submitted their data was mainly they had uh, mentioned that they'd like to know how to properly fit or what kind of model should be used to fit the low frequency region. So that will be something to keep in mind um, as, we, as I go through uh, the analysis of this data. But first, just to kind of hammer home how this works, I'd like to just show a short little animation of this electrolyzer. So again, we have this anode cathode membrane kind of construction uh, separated uh, and contained in this architecture here. We have a sort of uh, gas or liquid flow region where on the anode side, we flow this reactant, which in this case is water. So not really a fuel, but we'll just call it a reactant here. Again, you have to apply energy. So once we start applying a voltage or supply the system with energy, we get our anode reaction, which is basically just water splitting. For those of you familiar with PEM fuel cells, as I mentioned before, this is basically the reverse oxygen reduction reaction. So almost everything in an electrolyzer is just a fuel cell and backwards, as I said. Uh, but you can recognize this equation as oxygen reduction reaction in reverse. Um, now, just like in a PEM fuel cell, the ORR is the rate limiting step. So too, in an electrolyzer, the similar reaction in the other way is also rate limiting. It's just that it occurs on the cathode and not on the anode. Um, but still we have water that splits into oxygen gas as part of the product of this uh, electrolyzer. You get four electrons and four protons. The protons go across the membrane to the cathode. The electrons travel through the external circuit. On the anode side, we have no fuel, but sometimes you send a carrier gas or water or something like that. And on the cathode, a very simple and quick reaction where the protons combine with electrons and you get hydrogen gas. So this is in essence, how the electrolyzer functions. Now, again, as I mentioned, this person was mainly concerned with the low frequency data in that region. Now at low frequency, as with most electrochemical uh, systems, you typically are encountering the higher impedance processes 
as well as things like diffusional effects. Now, in the case of an electrolyzer, the higher impedance would be the more rate limiting step, which in this case is the anode. So even though I showed the anode first, as far as an impedance is, experiment is concerned, typically the anode should theoretically show up and have its data at the lower frequencies. And also this is where you'll have things like water uptake and water flooding and diffusion and things like that because we're flowing water on this side. So because I have a gas diffusion layer that is typically of a known thickness and it's a porous boundary, it's like carbon paper, um, one circuit element that's often used to describe that diffusional process is called a Warburg short or a Warburg diffusion or a finite Warburg. These are all names for the same thing. If you joined me from my previous webinar series, as I mentioned at the top, I discussed this element in the third week. Um, as I said, this is an advanced fitting webinar. So I'm, not, I'm gonna show a little bit of review on this component, but I'm not going to uh, spend a lot of time on the theory and the basics because I'm trying to do mostly uh, the analysis, right? But I will just give a brief overview of this component as it relates to those parameters like diffusion. So the impedance in the mathematics of a Warburg short is a somewhat complicated expression involving a hyperbolic tangent. That's not important for you, um, but mainly we have this W and we have this B. So there are two constants or terms that come out of the Warburg short. The W is used to get the diffusion coefficient and the B is essentially used to get this delta. This delta is that diffusion layer thickness. So because the, uh, we have a finite length diffusional path, um, the delta here is not necessarily infinite like it is, some of you might be familiar with a Warburg that is like a 45 degree line um, at low frequency. Well, this is assuming that it doesn't necessarily infinite. And this D is the diffusion coefficient. Okay, so mathematically this Warburg short is kind of like something between an infinite Warburg and a resistor. So at the higher frequencies, this element does actually act somewhat like an infinite Warburg. However, at the lower frequencies, it um, resolves to a resistor essentially. And the value of that resistor is W times B. So I'm gonna show you this with some calculations a little bit later, but this can be relevant. Um, and that coefficient W, as I mentioned, this equation is straight out of Barden Faulkner's electrochemical methods textbook um, basically I can get this diffusion coefficient, an estimate of this diffusion coefficient from a bunch of constants about my uh, system as well as just our, our, our ideal gas constant and Faraday's constant and that W. Here is the data that this person sent to me about their electrolyzer. Now the first thing that I always do when someone sends data or they want to do analysis and I, and I always recommend this as well is to run Kramer's Kronig analysis. Now, if again, if you joined my previous webinar series during the first week, I discussed Kramer's Kronig as a kind of circuit fit to determine the validity of the impedance data. There are three conditions for valid impedance and Kramer's Kronig essentially tests for those. And so basically in a somewhat quantitative, somewhat qualitative way, Kramer's Kronig can help you determine if the data is good basically. And overall, very low error statistic um, a little bit of deviation at high frequency, which is somewhat expected, as well as deviation at low frequency, uh, which is also somewhat expected uh, at low frequency, particularly in this system. As I mentioned, we have things like water flooding, water uptake. Um, when you have more kind of water maybe getting in the way, let's say, uh, you might have situations where the data will be a little noisy, let's say, uh, if there's some extra, you know, uh, liquid kind of gathering and pooling and things like that. So. Uh, a little bit of scatter, but overall, um, you know, uh, still something that you can get an average circuit fit for, and that's what I'll show you today. The summary of the Kramer's Kronig is essentially says this data is good enough to fit. Okay. A couple other features about this data set, though, is you'll notice at high frequency we have a little bit of this kind of um, tail here that it appears almost like if I were to maybe finish this, it either goes straight up or uh, you know, I could imagine it might make a semicircle that would finish in negative, possibly finish in negative over here or something like that. Um, as, a, as a decent approximation for doing your circuit fitting, many times it's reasonable to neglect this high frequency 
data, which is sometimes referred to as artifact or something of this nature. So that's what I'm gonna do initially. The next observation that I make is that just as a basic set of features, it appears like I have about two sort of semicircles, if you will, right? I have this kind of large semicircle here. It looks like around this area, there's kind of an inflection and then kind of a last semicircle to this low frequency region. So the first and most basic fit, ignoring all the things I just told you about that Warburg element is just to kind of do two Randall's elements. And so this is kind of just a good way to get a first approximation, at least of, of the values of my capacitors and my resistors and, and things like that to kind of start um, my circuit fitting analysis. And so I'm gonna do all the next set of things relatively quickly here, but um, just to let you know what I'm doing here. So the first things again, uh, if you join my previous series on the fifth week, I talked about some advanced fitting features. One of those is to lock alpha at one while you're doing your first fitting that can help hone the values in. Um, the other thing that I will do is because I know typically for things like batteries and fuel cells and electrolyzers, typically they're characterized by very high uh, capacitance and very low resistance or low impedance. And you can see this is in the milliohm range. Both of these CPEs or basically capacitors have been maximized. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna increase the ranges for my capacitors. And just in case I'm going to decrease the lower limit of my resistors from 10 to one milliohm to give it a little more room to fit. Run my fit one more time. Oh, and of course, as I mentioned, you see that this is trying to fit that um, that that artifact, what I called. So what I, the other part that I wanna do is to fix this problem is I'm gonna highlight the high frequency points maybe until somewhere in this area when it starts to kind of turn the corner, so to speak. And so if I neglect those results, I can try to get the two semicircles to fit about where I'm interested, let's say. Uh, I'm gonna swap these two CPEs, these two resistors, so they fit in the opposite way. Also this CPE needs to be given a little more room. So I'm gonna make it 10, do a fit, unlock alpha, and get my final fit, so to speak. And now one thing I'll notice is that it's kind of flattened the whole thing together. And so what I'm gonna do, and then this, this is some of this is again, just as advanced features here. I'm just kind of um, doing some of these things for the lack of time. I don't have a lot of time to overall explain, but you can see that some of the fitting features we have in the software, we have multiple fitting methods. Typically this Levenberg Markhart LM, is sufficient. We also have weighting methods. And you can see when I switch from parametric to unity, it really kind of captures that um, inflection point well. Sometimes in unity works better, sometimes parametric works better. This particular case, unity works a little better. Okay, so basically here we go. I've done my first fit. I've got a decent result. It's pretty good. You can see the error is relatively low. Um, you know, not a bad result. But of course, as I'm trying to answer these questions like, what about the diffusion? What about the low frequency region? Number one is I'm not really able to answer those with this. This is just a, a resistor capacitor Randall's element. It's not giving me any information about diffusion really. So that's a problem, number one. Number two is that I mentioned the anode should occur at low frequency. The cathode, which is the easier reaction should occur at higher frequency. So if I'm gonna say and ascribe this first Randall's element to the cathode, because that's the lower impedance at higher frequency, first as in from left to right on the Nyquist plot. And then the second, higher impedance, lower frequency, Randall's element to the anode. Well, I should look at the resistances here. And this is actually exactly backwards of what I think it should be. We have 37 milliohms and we have eight or nine milliohms. That makes no sense. Right, Math, just, just numerically, everything I just said would imply that the higher impedance process, the anode, the one that's rate limiting, probably should have a higher impedance, right? It should be a harder process to, you know, to the charge transfer resistance should be higher, I would expect. 
And that's exactly opposite of what we see based on my what I just mentioned as my analysis. So I'd like to keep that in mind. I'm going to move to the next fit. But basically, that's, again, this is kind of a first analysis. I'm not satisfied with this analysis. So now I'm going to try and move forward. And I'm going to actually start to use that Warburg element that I mentioned. So now let's imagine drawing a circuit where I have my leading resistor again, my ohmic resistance. Let's say I have another Randall's element for that cathode. Let's name this Q2 for making these the same uh, number. And then let's say I'm going to add my Warburg short. And what I'm going to do this time for the first approximation is I'm going to kind of make an assumption that that Warburg short, which is used to describe that porous finite boundary at the anode, can be both used to describe the anode itself and the diffusion, sort of all, all in one. Okay, just give this circuit some name and try to fit. Now, I'm gonna to have to do the same kinds of things with the parameters, which I'll do in a moment. Uh, you can see that the computation takes uh, a little bit longer when I add a Warburg short, simply from um, the mathematics of, of the Warburg, it has that hyperbolic tangent. Um, it's a little more computationally intensive. So it does take slightly longer to do the calculation. But what the point that I'm making here is that I'm going to try and use this Warburg element again to describe both the diffusion and the sort of impedance or the resistance of my anode. You know, if you recall from my slides, I showed that the uh, resistance at low frequency is equivalent to W times B. And so one way for me to do this is to say, okay, well, from the W, I can get an uh, estimate of the uh, diffusion coefficient. I can also try to get an estimate of the uh, impedance of the process itself by multiplying the W and the B that I get. So that's what I'm going to try to do here. And right away, I see that I, I haven't neglected the higher frequency portion here. So I need to try to do that as well. But I'm going to do the same kinds of things on the parameters as I did before. Again, I'm going to lock alpha at one. I'm going to um, increase. I increased that uh, limit of my CPE. Um, I decreased the limits on uh, my resistors as well. And um, the Warburg element here, uh, W, um, as you can see, that this is at one. And so that's uh, sort of the default uh, minimum limit for that uh, W element. And um, it, it quickly found the minimum. So what I what I needed to do was to decrease that limit um, by a little bit to allow it enough room. And I, right away, I can see it's trying to fit the high frequency region. So what I want to do, again, as I mentioned, is to remove maybe up to about here. I'm going to return to the values I had before. And we'll run this fit one more time. I'm kind of doing the same analysis here, which is to say I'm using this first semicircle. We'll try the unity again one more time. I'm using this first semicircle. You see the same kind of inflection. Almost the fit looks almost the same. It's just that now I have my Warburg element, which allows me a little more freedom to calculate the diffusion coefficient, right? Okay, so what I can do is I can actually copy these results. Here's These are the, the fitting results. You can see the, the error is about the same as before. Um, and I've still assumed that this first semicircle is that cathode. So I'm still actually kind of falling to the same assumption I made before, which I was critical of myself. And in fact, if I take the results that I got, I multiply W times B, you can see I have seven here, seven milliohms, for example. Um, and uh, the resistance or the impedance from the cathode, for example, is 38. So I'm in the same sort of problem that I, I had before, which is to say the order of the um, impedance is backwards. I should have a higher impedance for my anode than my cathode. Okay, so the last fit that I'm gonna do here is gonna try to address what I just said, which is that I don't really trust my own analysis here. I think, I think what I need to do is I need to focus the fit to make the anode and cathode make sense in, 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 uh, in combination, basically. 
So what I'm going to do this time instead is I'm going to make this CPE and Randall's element. Here's the cathode one. Now I'm going to add another Randall's element for the anode. And then my Warburg to be just basically used to describe the diffusional processes and nothing more. In other words, I'm not really going to sort of focus on the WB, uh, you know, the, the resistance. That might have some meaning per se, but I'm not going to sort of use that W times B as the anode impedance. I'm just going to say maybe that is, you know, some quantity related to the diffusion itself uh, in some in some manner, I suppose. So this is the last fit that I'm going to do on this data. I'll do a little bit of calculation to kind of show you that diffusion coefficient and um, the diffusion layer thickness. But now I'm going to do something a little more um, a little more interesting. And um, you know, again, this is going to hopefully kind of prove or, or, or illustrate the the point I made at the beginning, which is that because this is not my data, I could be wrong, right? I I'm making some some of my own attempts to analyze this data, uh, and I'm certainly open to uh, interpretation, you know, and by the, you know, if this is your data, for example, you may have a different opinion. But what I'm going to propose in this case is, so I'm going to still remove a lot of this high frequency uh, data here, because I do think a lot of it may be artifact. But you can see that perhaps if I include some of this high frequency points, if I assume maybe, let's say this some part of the data up here is related to the cathode and then this largest semicircle, that's the anode because that's the biggest semicircle I have. Maybe that's the anode and then just the low frequency, that's the diffusion. That's kind of what I'm going for now. Okay, so I'm gonna kind of, I'm gonna try and make this software. Again, I'm gonna lock alpha. I'm gonna increase the range for these CPEs similarly to what I've done thus far. And really what, I, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get the software to focus that first um, Randall's element of the cathode on the high frequency data. And uh, you might see something kind of interesting happen when I do that. So just as I set all of these parameters here, we'll try to get this fit. To, to go and what I'm, what you're gonna see hopefully here is that I'm trying to kind of fit data that isn't really there, um, but perhaps the analysis or the, the explanation for that would just be that the high frequency portion and this kind of uh, tail, you know, this artifact, if you will, um, any of those kinds of terms that people tend to use, um, that it's, it's simply just an, sort of an inaccuracy of the instrument or the hardware. And so um, I have to kind of extrapolate, for example, the data uh, at this high frequency to get a measure of what the impedance is um, or what those parameter values are for my cathode. Um, and so uh, as soon as this finishes here, hopefully we're gonna see what I mean. So you see already that there's basically a semicircle here um, on data that doesn't exist, right? I've, I'm kind of making an assumption. And now I'll, I'll unlock alpha and, and get the sort of the final fit here. And, and uh, this, this semicircle might change a little bit and then I'll kind of make my final point about that, right? I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a, making an assumption about the data that uh, the accuracy of that is somewhat questionable. And, and that's a, admittedly so. But here's my rationale behind why this could be an accurate way to sort of analyze this high frequency is that if I'm saying this is the cathode, well, first of all, my error by doing that is about an order of magnitude lower. So right away, that's a good thing. I'll put the data in here so I can compare. And now, again, I don't have to do W times B. I can just look at the differences of the impedance of R2 and R3. So now R2 is the cathode. R3 is the anode, you see 129, 13 and 37. Now, finally, 
I have the order of magnitude I'm looking for. My anode has higher impedance than my cathode. That's what I've been looking for all along. That makes sense and the phenomenon of what I know is occurring in my system. So again, some different, some, some tricky things about analyzing sort of data that isn't there. But the other way that I, I justify this is that I don't really care what's going on at the cathode. The cathode is the easy side of my, um, my, my electrolyzer, right? The, I don't, I'm only really interested in the rate limiting side. Okay. Uh, so even if that is inaccurate per se, I, I can sort of justify by saying, I don't exactly care because I'm just looking for the low frequency, the diffusion, those kinds of things. I'm going to copy these equations into my sheet just to kind of give me a visual. Okay. So here's the equations just to be able to see them. So I can get a, an estimate of this uh, diffusion coefficient by using this equation right here. So I have constants over here now, R times T. Uh, the quick disclaimer about these constants is that um, this, again, not being uh, my data, I had to make these values up. Now, of course, Faraday's constant is Faraday's constant and so is the ideal gas constant. But I actually was not sure what the surface area um, of this, uh, Person, this data, this person uh, who submitted their data, I don't know what the um, what actually their uh, a surface area was or concentration or any anything like that. So uh, the the excuse that I have here is if this is inaccurate, um, the date the number is not important. I, I'm mainly showing you how to calculate the diffusion coefficients from this uh, EIS analysis but the exact value don't um, focus so much on. But for what it's worth, even though I'm not sure that this was an accurate, the first uh, Warburg short analysis was so accurate, generally speaking here, I have, you know, whatever this number is, five, almost five, 10 to the minus eight centimeters squared per second, um, still about the same. So you can see the Warburg um, short element kind of doing its job. It's given me a value. It's given me the ability to calculate that, a, a, an estimate for that diffusion coefficient. And then finally, to calculate delta, which is that diffusion layer thickness, I can just multiply B times the square root of D. I'm going to put it into nanometers. Basically, I've got about 500 nanometers or what half a micron. Um, and again, uh, my my caveat here is that these the values I'm using are assumed. They may be um, inaccurate. Um, but and for the record, you know, I, I might expect something like micron level. So I'm, I'm maybe a few orders of magnitude off based on whatever assumptions I've made. But for what it's worth, this is the procedure, right? This is kind of the completion of this analysis, so to speak, um, and how you might use the Warburg elements to calculate some of these diffusion parameters at low frequency. All right, folks, I hope you enjoyed this video. Again, don't forget to subscribe, like, and comment. All right. I'll see you soon.